Thank you very much for coming along. And we're going to start with Deirdre Creedle, who's an amazing person. She's been a fabulous um, helper to us. Um, she has, is a pharmacist um, from very many areas, from hospital, industry, academia and community. She was one of the first NPS Medicine Wise facilitators. Um, she has worked in Medicare Local. She's now working here at Charlie's at, is the, at the Connect um, part-time, which is fabulous, which means she can help us and other many, many projects the other parts of her time. Um, and we please welcome Deirdre. She's amazing. introduction. Um, I'd also like to pay my respects to the elders past and present, uh, the Noongar people. Um, I have the privilege of working with many uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander clients and um, I think just culturally it's really important that we do acknowledge that we are on um, the land of the traditional owners. So um, I would reiterate uh, Emily's comments. Before I start, I'd like to thank um, the, the Injury Control Council of WA and the Stay On Your Feet team, particularly um, Alison. And um, I might just get you guys to come out, Alison, and I know you don't like this, Danielle and Emily, and is it Judith? Julia. Julia. Um, these guys have done an amazing job. Uh, when we first had the concept of this idea, it was like, well, it's a no-brainer because everyone knows how important medicines are in uh, considering in falls prevention. And I think they got a bit of a taste of how hard this is. So I'd just like to say thank you because this is the start of, of a journey. And the fact that you guys are all here is awesome because you're part of early adopters and that you do realise the importance. The message is not going to be easy as you'll probably see over the next three hours, but I'd just like to say thank you. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So, um, yeah, I, I, the other thing I would like to say, and unfortunately for the people on webinar, you don't have uh, some facilitators, but I'm sure that we are taking questions on webinar. I'm hoping we are. But I have some helpers here today. Um, Matthew Schmidt, do you want to put your hand up, Matthew? Matthew's a pharmacy intern. Andrew Campbell is also a pharmacy intern from Sir Charles Gardner. And Nick Martin, who's one of my care coordinator colleagues. So um, he's a physiotherapist as well as a care coordinator. So um, these people are here to talk to you about, you know, and, and facilitate. We've got a case study at the end of the day, so they'll certainly be encouraging a lot of discussion. So these are our key messages, as Emily mentioned. Um, and we wanted to keep it really simple. So. I guess it's important that we all have an understanding that people who take multiple medications are at a greater risk of falling. And what we believe is that just the simple task of everyone having an up-to-date medicines list would go a long way to actually helping address some of those risks that we are aware of. And when we say a medicines list, one that's agreed by the doctor, the pharmacist, and most importantly, the patient or carer, is exactly what I'm talking about. Because when people come into hospital, uh, what you'll see is a lot of clinical pharmacists running around going, well, what do you take? But what do you really take? Not what the pharmacist thinks you take, not what the GP's got on their list, but what the patient actually takes. So I. You know, if, we, if you learn nothing else from this, this is a powerful tool. Simple, simple thing to actually try to encourage people to always have a medicines list on them. And believe me, I understand. They'll say, well, I know what I'm taking, but that doesn't help if they're not in a position to tell you. And when people are critically ill or they've had a fall, they're not in a position to tell you. I take that little pink one at three o'clock and this one at seven o'clock. So just this simple act of having an up-to-date medicines list reviewed annually and agreed upon by those three people, one of the most powerful false prevention interventions. Um, 
certainly sleeping tablets. We also want to highlight that and in my presentation you'll see I go quite hard on sleeping tablets because if any of you, any of you work in ED? No? So if you work in ED or visit ED, you'll sometimes see the panda eyes of some of our elderly. They look like they've been hit by a car. It's quite traumatic to see elderly people after a fall, especially if they have fallen face first. So sleeping tablets are often implicated and I have to say there's a nihilism around that. Do you know what I mean by nihilism? It's basically, oh, they're old. They're old and they can't get to sleep. So, you know, really it's almost cruel. So I'll address that a bit later as well. But sleeping tablets are something that we need to start a conversation on. We're not going to fix it in one hit and we don't aim to do that. It's patronising for our consumers. If we start to think we can just walk in and say, you shouldn't be taking that, it's patronising for the GPs who treat them. So I think we need to start the conversation about sleeping tablets, which is what today's all about. And uh, finally, I really want to put in a plug for home medicine reviews and meds checks. Can I ask the, the audience who's heard of a home medicine review? Uh, so most of you have. Um, we'd love to know from a, a hospital perspective to, do, to run that. You know, do you know what a home medicine review is? Do you know how to access one? So yeah, there's, I'm speaking to the converted, which is not unsurprising. But it's really to try and get that message out. You know, if you're not the pharmacist or the doctor, doesn't mean that you can't take action on this. So home medicine reviews and meds check are a fantastic way to actually, again, start that conversation. So some basics, we're going to go through things which, again, I'm sure you probably all know, but it's a nice way to actually ease into what we're going to be talking about. So what is a fall? And this is from WHO, an event which results in a person's inadvertently um, resting on the ground or floor or a lower level. An injurious fall is a fall that causes fracture to the limbs, hips or shoulders, or one that causes traumatic brain injury. This I find to be one of the most uh, stunning slides. I know it's old, but it hasn't changed, unfortunately. We haven't made a huge difference. So you can see that people track on pretty well uh, you know, the falls are really an issue in the younger years. They're different sorts of falls. The ones that, that result in deaths are when we get older. So you can see why we make a song and dance about this, because falls make people die. They're robbers of life. They're robbers of quality of life. And I'm sure the fact that you're he all here today is evidence of the fact that you understand just how significant a fall is. It takes away people's confidence, it takes away their quality of life, it makes their world smaller. And there are really good statistics to show that a third of people end up in nursing homes, a third of people die, and really that's only a third that don't suffer any major consequence. But it, it, they're damning stats and I think we have to start to make sure we act on this. So what do my colleagues and uh, doctors and pharmacists, what have we contributed to falls prevention? Well, in the last 10 years um, as a pharmacist, what I've noticed when we first talked about polypharmacy, you've all heard of polypharmacy? Yes. Polypharmacy. Does anyone know what the definition is? How many medicines? Five or more. Five or more, exactly. And that's... That's something that we, you know, I certainly grew up with. So five or more was considered a lot. If we had a few more uh, ward pharmacists here, um, Matt, would you like to tell me how many you think is the median that you see coming through somewhere like MAU? About 10, 15. About 10, 15. So that's the average number of medicines in people over 65 has skyrocketed in the last 10 years. And why is that? Well, you can see we're getting better at actually preventing lots of things. So it's that mentality of, well, you know, you need a, a medicine to protect you, a tablet to actually improve, you know, the 
the number of years that we're going to live. And there's great data out there from pharmaceutical companies that can show how many years extension we give to people when we prevent all of these things. And the truth is we are, we're staying alive. Now the question that started to be asked is at what cost? So the fact that polypharmacy was five and is now 10, you know, this is the new normal. People are on lots of medicines. And we think we have an understanding of what that means, but the truth be told, we're only gonna know what that means in another 10 years. What the consequences of having all of these multiple tablets to treat multiple morbidities. This is one of the new big problems that we have in aged care. And I guess my question is at what point do we stop preventing and actually look at our consumer and say, do you still want to be on this train, going one way in extending life, preventing disease? At what point do we stop and say, well, I think we need to consolidate. What do our consumers think? Have we been engaging them? Or have we been on a one-way track to prevent their heart disease, heart failure, diabetes, osteoporosis, falls and fracture? You know, these are all things that I think we're at some stage are going to have to have a long, hard conversation. And importantly, it's not just between medical teams up on MAU that are looking at people's medicines list and comorbidities. It will importantly include the consumer in that. So the risk factors for falls, you're going to hear a lot about this and I'm sure um, Dr. Kate Ingram will be talking a lot about what the importance of medicines and the contribution that medicines play in increasing the risk of falls. But you can see one of the things we say that, you know, falls is multifactorial and we need a multidisciplinary team is because it's not just one thing. And how hard is it? How hard is it when it's not just one thing? Because it's like when you go to the cardiologist, the cardiologist is there to treat your heart. You go to the endocrinologist, looking after your diabetes, they're treating your diabetes. But who's looking out for the whole? And that's why we've got a GP coming to talk to us today, because the GP's trying to manage the multiple morbidities and things like falls that belong to no one, but we're told belong to everyone. So when you see that, when you see that it's everyone's business, my question to you would be, is that because it's no one's business? Is that because we're trying to get people to do that little bit extra and think outside the square? Absolutely it is. So that's why you're here today. Not because you're the medicines experts, but because you're people with a vision and understand that it's not just my area in physiotherapy, it's not just me as a nurse or an OT, but I need to actually have perhaps an understanding of which medicines might be at risk and what I can do to contribute. So this is a, a great document, the um, Australian Commission for Safety and Quality in Healthcare. They've got three amazing documents. And if you're interested in falls, well worth the read, because it really drills down to what do we know about falls? Where is the evidence? You know, who, what helps? What's, what, where is there really good evidence? And evidence is what drives the health economics, if you like. So um, aged care facilities. I know, Carol, you work in aged care facility. Um, you've got physiotherapists in aged care. Yes. And yes. that's because there's proof. And what's their role? Their role is to um, develop care plans that can make the residents safe, have a look at their aims to see if they make sense. You know, like, do they need a stick or a walker? Or do they need something more? Or do we do one assist to assist with the carers? Um, and also to evaluate and look when residents have a fall so that we can make the environment safer. So for those on webinar, Carol's just given a, you know, a minute <laughs> summary of, of the many different roles that a physiotherapist has in an aged care facility, developing care plans, looking at someone's gait, actually making sure that the environment's safe, if they have a fall, they get involved. So 
Now, that position is there because there's actually really good evidence. So I know there's a fair few physiotherapists. We've got physiotherapists out there, yes. That's fantastic. So I guess these, these are the things that we know work. This is where the evidence is in. Many falls can be prevented. Um, addressing the injury, and these are the things that I also think we need to get better at. How did you fall? When did you fall? Why did you fall? Not just I fell. So really making sure we assess why did you fall? No fall is inconsequential, and we have to start being better detectives. Managing falls risk factors, engaging older people themselves, trying to destigmatize falls. I can tell you that I fell out the front of Sir Charles Gardner Hospital two years ago, very unceremonious. And I've been talking about falls for five years. And so when I did this, I had five bags and I was running late. So I was hurrying across the road and I, um, and I slipped and fell and, and I actually ended up doing a, a like in slow motion, a flying sort of fall with my feet coming over the top of my head. And this wonderful young doctor picked me up, sort of, you know, it was just lovely, had his stethoscope around him and, and helped gather my stuff. And he turned around to me and he said, now, are you going to go to your doctor? And I'm like, oh, I wasn't even 50 then. But, you know, I, I, I was so anxious that someone saw me. And in some ways it was a, an amazing moment for me because I'd been sitting on podiums preaching forever. And then I got a real taste of what it was like to fall to a lower level from being upright. And so I think we need to start to think about how that feels and why people feel shamed about falling. You know, we need to destigmatize it. And as a matter of fact, I did go to the doctor and I've got, um, you know, that's where I got my chronic disease. I've got osteoarthritis um, from, you know, a long history with running, but I can't bend now and I haven't got any knees left. So it was actually a good thing to go to the doctor. So I, I did, you know, practice what I preached after a suggestion, a shocking one I thought. But those are the things I think we need. We shouldn't have that nihilism. We have to try and make sure people understand the importance of understanding why they fell. And engaging with older people themselves is crucial. So um, fear of falling is massive and I'm sure we've all seen the consequences of that. So I'm going to talk quickly about interventions. And again, these are all from the uh, falls guidelines. And this is where you'll see that, let's, let's dissect what works and what doesn't. So an intervention is a therapeutic procedure or treatment strategy designed to cure, alleviate, or improve a certain condition. So that's the sort of template we're looking at for falls prevention. There's single interventions, multiple interventions, and multifactorial. And truly we want to know what's the evidence. And that's where a lot of our you know, money is now being driven into, well, if there's no evidence for it, why are we actually doing it? So single best intervention, so level one evidence, exercise works, and that's why we've got physios with falls prevention. And that's why a lot of the, a lot of the falls initiatives are run by fabulous physiotherapists. So, you know, there's really good evidence that what you do works. Um, balance training, you know, Tony Petta, I, he's done the balance stuff and the Tai Chi. And, and again, that is really fantastic to see that um, there are these interventions that actually work. Removing cataracts, again, something that I, till I was into falls, didn't realize there was such good evidence around it. Modifying home environment, so our OT colleagues, we've got some OTs here today as well, I think, yep. Yeah, so really, you know, you guys are so important in getting in the home, assessing where the falls are, looking at the risks, and I would say that's such an iterative process because I don't know what it is, but old people in mats and rugs, don't they love them? And how many times must you go out and go, yes, I've done it, and come back six months later and go, oh, they're back. So, you know, kudos to you guys. It is an iterative process, and I would say medicines are no different. Um, 
so supervising gradual withdrawal of psychoactive medicines and we struggled a little bit with this so psychoactive medicines what do I mean by that so I mean anything that acts centrally so sleeping tablets antidepressants antipsychotics and again we call them antipsychotics and we struggle with that word as well because often uh, we're using things in a sedative capacity so we're seeing lots of Seroquel and Quetiapine being used not just for their role in um, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, but we're seeing them used as sedatives to try and dampen down behaviours in the elderly. So things like Risperidone. So these are all medicines which are actively used in the elderly and are actively contributing to falls. So if you see a new medicine, you know, and if you're working in subacute care, and you've got access to the discharge summary, just take a gander down the, down the discharge summary and see what's new. And if it's some of these medications, these are the things that we know have huge impact. So vitamin D and calcium supplements, and I'm going to leave that to um, Kate to talk about a bit later today. So home safety for people, and interestingly, it's not for everyone. It's a little bit like medicines review. We'd like to do it for everyone, but it's got to be targeted and risk stratified. So for those that need it, it's a fabulous intervention to have the home safety assessment because OTs going out to homes is an expensive intervention. Absolutely well worthwhile, but a little bit like pharmacists going out to every home. You can't do that across the board, but it's really appropriate if we're risk stratifying and making sure we're referring our OT colleagues appropriately. Um, cardiac pacing, another one that before I got into falls wasn't aware, but that, you know, where people suddenly fall down, they have a sinkable um, episode. Sometimes their, their heart rhythm is just, it stops, so they actually need help with having a pacemaker. Um, and a collaborative review by uh, GPs and pharmacists. So they're all good interventions, but they're not the best. So, and that's, and why would that be, you think? Why is it that if these are, you know, important, why doesn't it quite get there? And I guess I'd like to leave you just with a little suggestion that it has to be collaborative. That doesn't just mean pharmacists and doctors talking about medicines. We've got to engage our consumers. That's going to be when you send off the bells and whistles and have great ceremony because that's when we're going to start to, I believe, see real improvements made. So the reason we're all here and all from different walks of life with different professions and different experiences is because what we know is that multifactorial does work. And again, that's not that easy. So getting people together to look at situations. And I know we do this quite well in um, acute medical units and again in aged care facilities where they have interdisciplinary meetings, where everyone brings to the table their experiences and what they know from having seen people fall and having helped people recover from falls. So again, the falls clinic specialists, has everyone heard of Falls Clinic Specialists? Yes, everyone's nodding and I'm sure um, the people on the webinar are well aware as well. But that's where you go when things are just not working. So where it is difficult, it's difficult for GPs if you've got four specialists, isn't it? Four specialists, that's when you need to bring in the heavy artillery like the geriatrician because that's where you do get medical governance. So if the GP is feeling, well, I can't possibly stop that medication um, because that was put on by the cardiologist and the geriatrician walks in and goes, well, this is all great, but if it's resulting in a fall, this is the end for that person. So, you know, honestly, falls clinics are awesome. Now, I'm not going to go through everyone's role here because you're going to hear about that today. But again, this is all taken from the Falls Prevention Guidelines and it goes through and it looks at what um, they consider each individual profession's role is. Nurses, looking at vitamin D and perhaps home safety and exercise. Um, in fact, I think we've got an exercise physiologist here, haven't we? Have we? Yes, excellent. So you can see how 
falls are, you know, we, we need everyone in this. And, and this is the allied health professional role. So really looking at exercise work. So, you know, my message for pharmacists is we need to start to understand that it's not just about medicines, but that's why I'm here today to talk to you guys because it isn't just about medicines, but we want you to be part of, you know, looking at, at medicines as perhaps needing some intervention. So there's lots of people who can help with falls. A word of caution, older people don't want to be overwhelmed. So in, in our mission to, to uh, prevent falls, I guess we have to also be mindful um, of making sure we're not over inundating them with too much information. And that's why the GP, from my perspective, is a perfect person to be the care coordinator, if you like, of those interventions and probably the best port of call to initiate. Okay. So yeah, that's just a reminder that um, we do have access to fabulous full specialist services and uh, I know from experience when things get tough, um, even in aged care facilities, I've requested um, assistance and that's with physiotherapists and um, pharmacists and doctors and nurses all working together. Sometimes you do need that expertise. I'm going to dwell a little on this. Uh, this is one of my favourite slides. It's now getting really quite old. It's from um, the American Association of Family Practice. It's a journal from 2000, so it's 15 years old. and so this sort of shows you the full threshold for repeated falls and you can see so b is an acute illness so that's why hospitals feature you know the the need to actually care for people in hospitals because they're a really high falls risk when they're acutely unwell um, so c here is moderate illness loss of mobility some medication falls due to extrinsic factors so that's c now, D is a severely ill patient with many medications who falls even without extrinsic factors. So that's D, and then you've got E, patient, elderly patient with numerous age-related falls because of extrinsic factors. Now, this was in 2000, and as I said, 2000, it was probably polypharmacy was five medicines. I would love to see this slide replicated with medication burden just to show where are we now. So yeah, there's not a great deal of evidence, but are we looking? So absence of evidence is not always evidence of absence. And my question is, now we've had this explosion of medicines and people are just becoming, you know, honestly, pill camels. They're just taking on so many more medicines. Are we revisiting these sorts of studies instead of saying, well, there's not a lot of evidence that reducing medicines can actually improve healthcare. I'd like to see more research on that. So um, the Department of Health has got um, the Stay On Your Falls website where I always direct pharmacists to go to because it's got fantastic resources. And certainly that's why you're all here today. Perhaps not to become pharmacists, to, but to be aware of what you can do to improve medication safety in people at risk. So during the day, I'm hoping we're going to get an opportunity to talk to each of the, um, the medical professionals who are going to present today, which is uh, a GP. We've got Dr. Kate Ingram, who's a specialist, and we've also Dr. Dr. John McLaughlin, who's a sleep physician. And it will be great to hear how you know they perceive allied health and pharmacists and nurses and, and everyone's role in actually highlighting the risk of force. How do they feel about it? Because if you're not a pharmacist, how does it feel to be able to say, oh, I've noticed someone's on a medicine um, that can increase their risk of falls. Is there a chance to review it? One of the things that you may well get pushed back, believe me, and I know if you've got a story saved up for me telling you that you've been told to get back in role, it's not your job, medicines are my job, welcome to my world. <laughs> because as a pharmacist, I don't get prescribing rights, but I do get the chance to ask for a review. 
So it's all about diplomacy. And sometimes, you know, this is a difficult area. But what I'd ask you to do is be brave. You are going to get pushed back. You are going to get doctors who are insulted that you are actually asking something that has nothing to do with you. You're also a healthcare professional who's advocating for your patient, consumer or client. And at the end of the day, that's to me where, where we really need to make sure we are. If, if we're seeing the, the damning statistics that result in the death of a third of people who, who fall at a very elderly age, then we must move. So these are, are the, this is um, sort of my life, which is trying to get that nihilism addressed. So we're on, we're on a one-way train with you know, medicines that can fix everything and do everything in nice, clean, pristine, randomised control clinical trials that don't bear any resemblance to the real world. The consequences are we are seeing more and more and more people coming into hospital with adverse consequences of medicines. And a lot of these are avoidable. And that's why we need to make sure we're highlighting the risk. So we love medicines. And it's not medicines in their, in their prescribed form, but people self-medicate as well. Fish oil, glucosamine, Turmeric now is the new best thing in pain relief. Uh, you can probably throw a whole lot more at me and you know, I have to run off and go to Sloan Kettering website and Google the next herb that's apparently the new wonder drug, you know, krill, all of those things. So they all, you know, anything that has an, a, an action will have a reaction in the body. Just because something's natural or herbal or not prescribed by the doctor, mm, did you read the CMI? Do you know what I mean by CMI? Consumer Medicines Information, where the pharmaceutical company lists all the potential problems. It's no wonder people don't take their medicines when they read that. But, you know, the truth is all things that you take into your body will have a consequence. And what we're wanting to do is just have a look at that. Get people who, whose job it is to make sure, yeah, that mix is okay. So a meds check, has anyone heard of a meds check? Okay, so this is a new initiative. Uh, it's come through in the last two years and it's basically a medicines check that's conducted in the pharmacy um, by a pharmacist with the consumer. So really, these are awesome for people who don't necessarily want someone in their home. And let's face it, not everyone wants to invite often a stranger into their home. So I do a lot of home medicine reviews, but I also know there's some people who don't want you in their home. So how could we address that? Meds checks, I think, is, is a great way to do that. It does have to be done properly. And you know, I one of the things that I've had my um, pharmacy interns do is find out if the pharmacists um, that the people who've come into hospital provide that, because we're offering um, you know home medicine re reviews or meds checks, and often people don't want people in their home. So these are a great initiative. So again, it's it's something that if they don't want the full blown you know, collaborative review, which from my point of view is the best because that's where you're going to get the doctor involved. This is at least some way towards getting people to understand the importance of having a medicines review. And everyone walks away with one of these from a meds check. They all get a medicines list. So again, I think it's absolutely imperative to know that these are available. You don't have to know too much about it. They can only have one meds check every two years, but if they go into hospital, it starts again. If they have a fall or have a, a consequence of a medicine, they absolutely can have another meds check. Um, and unfortunately, we've got to do a bit of education around GPs and also pharmacists about the importance of revisiting things when a, a con health consequence happens. So a home medicine review, one of my favorite things, um, is a structured collaborative healthcare service provided by the um, GP pharmacist 
and importantly involves the consumer and carers. And the reason I love it is probably the same reason OTs love going into homes. You actually see the truth. You find the medicine's truth. You end up getting, after the first 15 minutes when they realise you're actually not that bad, they'll come and bring out their next lot of medicines that they take because they didn't want to show you those because they didn't come from your pharmacy. <laughs> so, and they didn't want to really show you those ones because their doctor doesn't like herbal medicines and told them off once. So it's all about developing trust and seeing people in their own home. And I honestly believe there is huge value in healthcare professionals visiting the home. And you are the eyes and ears. So if you are in the home, in whatever capacity, physiotherapist, pharma, uh, pharmacist, occupational therapist, nurse, um, CCT team, it's fabulous because you do get to see the truth of how someone is really coping. When people come to an appointment, they put on their clothes and their, and their coping coat, and you don't see the reality. In their home, you see the truth of how they're managing or not. And so that is such a powerful intervention, probably <coughs> underestimated, I would say, by almost everyone. But this is something that increasingly we know. The value of getting a healthcare professional in the home is, is really underestimated. What I like about the Home Medicine Review is it's, it's actually a collaborative. So it has to be on GP referral. So the GP is engaged from the start. The tricky part about a meds check is it doesn't involve the GP. Um, hopefully in, in good community pharmacists, there is usually a follow-up. So where a meds check is done very well, they will often provide the medicines list and suggest that a patient goes back to the GP just to touch base and make sure that everything is as they thought it was, as the GP thinks it is. So an agreed medicines list between all of the players in the medication management journey. So one of the difficulties, as you'll see, is that the HMR process is quite convoluted and a lot of GPs can't be bothered. They don't get any money for the referral, which can take them quite a while. Um, they get money when the patient comes back, and if they don't come back, that can be problematic. Um, so it's a bit of a clunky item number for them, and you know, general practice runs like a machine. And to be really honest, they're not thinking medication review when someone walks in the door. They're dealing with whatever the issue is. And they don't have medication review printed on their forehead. They do for pharmacists, because we always think where there's a problem, it's drug related. That's our mantra. Doctors think where there's a problem, what's new in the disease. So that's why I love it, because you know, often it's a little bit of both. And if you can get those conversations happening, and the GP who's going to be talking to you today, you know, is a GP, Dr. Pradeep Jaisuria, who I've worked very closely with, and we have quite robust discussions around, um, around medicines and, and diseases. And, you know, sometimes I'm right, sometimes he's right, but it's really a conversation, and it always revolves around the patient and the consumer at the end of the day. So I think these are a fantastic initiative. I'd like to see more of them, but I understand that they're not that simple. But there's brochures there, and I think it's, it's actually not just for pharmacists and doctors to be suggesting these. It's for other healthcare professionals to know that these are available and accessible. Okay, so this is just a very quick flick about what pharmacists do when they review. So they check for dose drug issues, um, they check for medication related issues, potential and actual, and we really don't get too hung up on lots of potential. So if you, if you, um, as I know Nick does, read MIMS to send him to sleep at night, there's lots of interactions in there. So you have to actually sort the wood from the trees. And Dr. Google's great until you have competing comorbidities. And that's why it really is important that you get to the bottom of what's an important medication related issue here. Um, condition specific issues, we are in the age of comorbidities. People are collecting them. As we get older, we're getting sicker and we're treating, yet using lots of medicines to treat that. So it's hard because 
we'll look at guidance and pathways and you'll get conflicting guidance and pathways. So the diabetes medicines might, might actually not be great for osteoporosis and vice versa. So, you know, that's where you need an overview. Um, and I think most importantly is engaging our consumers, making sure that we're not just being patronising and telling them what to do, that we're looking at what they do and looking at their belief system. You know, one of the funniest things that I, you know, when I first started doing this and people would say to me over the phone, I've got so many tablets, I, I don't like being on them, but they know exactly what it is, who prescribed it initially and the importance of it. And at the end of the day, you can be there for an hour and you ask them the question, so which one do you think you can do without? None of them, none of them, they're all important. Prefaced, of course, with the first one, don't touch my sleeping tablets. <laughs> so, um, falls risk increasing drugs, you'll be hearing more about these from Dr Ingram. Um, and I put those in there deliberately, hopefully, in, in terms that everyone can understand, because I think sometimes in pharmacy and medicine we like to complicate things. So, you know, when I do a medicines list, I don't write um, ACE inhibitor, I write blood pressure medication. So we've got to be making it understood by um, our consumers. Um, medical conditions that contribute to falls, again, um, Dr Ingram will be talking about that. I'd really like to direct you to this wonderful toolkit. It's got lots of things in there and it's worth, it's worth a half an hour of just scanning to see if there's anything in there that you would find worthwhile. So, you know, great resources for when you fall at home. That's been one of the most amazing things, just, you know, and as a pharmacist doing home medicine reviews, I ask people, do you know how to get up off the floor? And that's borrowed authority from my physio and OT colleagues. So that's what I'm hoping from today, that you'll feel more empowered to have a look at someone's medicines list. And, you know, not, not frighten people, but actually just encourage them to do something. Um, and again, these are all snapshots of the toolkit that look at, you know, why people fall. Are these slides are all going to be available on the website, are they? Fall? Yes? Yeah, we'll send them out. Oh, sending them out. Yep. Terrific. That's great. So again, um, some great resources that just put it in, in layman's terms. So why is it that blood pressure medicines increase your risk of falls? Through what mechanism? Because I know the physios love mechanisms, don't they, Nick? They're always good for that. So um, just, I'd like to sort of end on the, the benzodiazepine issue. Um, I think it's important that we don't judge. And, and I think in hospitals, we judge a lot. So we look at the consequences of, of you know, people who end up in ED. And it's easy to think, why did that GP not stop that medicine? You know, why did that pharmacist not encourage the GP to stop the medicine? And you'll see it even in the literature where it's like, how worrying is it that we know that this stuff's problematic, yet we don't do anything? And even um, headlines like this, lazy GPs keep on doling out powerful sleeping pills to the elderly when they should only be used for short-term treatment. That is the truth. But wow, look at the terms. Lazy GPs doling out like they're enjoying it. I just think context. One of the things that Pradeep said to me when I first came and did the home medicine reviews to me was context, Deirdre. You've got to get context. And general practice is all about context. So it's not about doling out GPs. I actually talked to people um, at, I think it was about four years ago, massive lot of consumers, and I said to them, do you know who I blame most for the fact that GPs are continually writing prescriptions for um, benzodiazepines? You, you, because you are the ones constantly going in and saying, my life's not worth living, I'm old, I shouldn't have to put up with this, I need a rest, I can't sleep very difficult conversations to have about appropriate use of benzos. 
And as an NPS facilitator, we talked a lot about uh, rational use of medicines. And from talking to GPs where you go and think, how can they keep doling these tablets out? I think the bottom line was we need to stop having creating that problem. So short-term use is absolutely the case and we need to be vigilant. In hospitals, we don't start the medicine that gets continued on in aged care facilities. And, and if someone comes to an aged care facility, absolutely understandable that it's foreign and that they're freaked out and they're anxious, maybe short-term use is okay. But how do we make sure that that gets reviewed? We don't go to sleep on these things because that's the issue, not the short-term use. We need to be making sure there's review. And one of the things I heard Chris Beer talk about was the fact that even when they did a double-blind study and showed people improved when they took them off their sleeping medication, when it was unblinded, they all wanted their sleeping tablet back. And it was tragic. In fact, I thought that, you know, even in a randomised controlled trial, that we couldn't change behaviour. And I think that's where we've got to come to. This is not just about doctors. This is about a conversation between doctors and their patients and consumers.